going to cover every little item on this timeline. I'll, I'll try to, you know, you can read over it later. So these are yours to keep, do whatever you want with them. There are books we could recommend if you really want to read Right. There are, there are other books. Oh, can we help? They probably help you out of here, but I don't think so. It would just be taller. <laughs> can everybody see it? Mm -hmm. So you can get angled differently. Okay. So, um, I think uh, Peter mentioned some of the, the tribes and such at the, way back, but I just wanted to mention that Celtic tribe, boy, that's where the Bohemian name comes from, from that. So we have Slovaks and Czechs and Germanic and, you know, the Celtic tribes all there. And, and the only reason I'm mentioning this, this is great Moravian empire, is that they take control of the, the Slovaks, the Slovak tribe, and basically for a thousand years, they, they have control, they're, they're lumped together. And, and the reason why I bring this up is because um, the Czech people, which is the Bohemian Moravian area, they basically lumped together in a different dynasty. So, so from very early on, you know, talking like 800, those two groups are kind of separate and are on, on slightly different tracks. And that difference, that, that uh, separation between the two is still continuing today. What? And this is this empire is um, the Bohemian Empire, the, uh, you'd say, Przem, Przemyslid, the dynasty, something like that. <laughs> this would be the Czechs. So the, that would be here in the pink right there. Time frame of that? Uh, this is around, um, you'll, you'll see Putin's dynasty around, okay, uh, yeah, 900 there underneath, and the Moravian there under the 863. <coughs> okay, so in the Przemyslid dynasty, you have good King Wenceslas. He was one of the Bohemian princes, so the Wenceslas of Christmas Carol fame. Um, and he actually tried to establish Christianity in, in the area, in this Bohemian Empire. Um, and he tried to join Bohemia and Moravia, be more united. He was killed by his brother, he assassinated. His brother was named Boleslav the Cruel. So you think that would have tipped him off. <laughs> you have a brother with that name. Um, so right there is the statue of good King Wenceslas, the Bohemian prince, and he's the patron saint of Bohemia, and that is in Prague. And so there is Wenceslas Square in Prague, and that's the statue right there. There's a close-up of it, and there are some tourists enjoying oh, gelato. Yes. That would be you and me. <laughs> there in the square. <laughs> And if you turn, standing right there, if you turn around the other direction, that's what you see today. Wow. That's when we were there. It says square, but it's this long, narrow thing that goes all along with it. Yeah, I suppose maybe that that's the, the square part. <laughs> yeah, and then it's just this big, big, long courtyard. So that statue there is still there. Okay, so... Um, around 1,000... Um, the Bohemian Empire basically gets absorbed into the Holy Roman Empire, uh, but they still have their own king, and and that area, uh, Prague is actually is very important, very central. It, it has a big role in what goes on there. And you know, the Holy Roman Empire Empire was not holy; it was not Roman, and it was not an empire. It was really the Catholic Church. Um, you know a lot of abuse abusing its power and sharing its uh, lands with the nobility and that's basically what it was a german background okay so now we're hitting in the 1300s the golden age of bohemia <coughs> uh this this gentleman right here is king charles the fourth again a king of bohemia and he was made the holy roman emperor so then, um, so not only of just the Bohemian area, but then he was, was bigger than that. And so he actually made, built up Prague, he actually made it a center of this big empire, and he made Bohemia one of the greatest kingdoms in medieval Europe. Uh, we saw, um, well, 
we saw his, um, he's buried in, in St. Vitus Cathedral, which is <coughs> in this golden age of Bohemia. He actually had built the St. Vitus Cathedral. He built what is now Charles University, which was the first university in Europe. And uh, Christopher, our, our drummer, his brother, I don't know if he's still going there, but was doing medical school at, at Charles University. I hear it's rather tough. And, and then there is the Charles Bridge as well. Um, so there is a picture again of the Cathedral of St. Vitus with some tourists in front of it. <laughs> a tour up there at the top of the hill above Prague. And there's the St. Charles Bridge, and there's some, yeah, some random tourists walking <laughs> along the St. Charles Bridge. It's kind of like Where's Waldo. Yeah. <laughs> like what? Where's Waldo? There's Charles <laughs> University. All right. So he he had these things started and built way back way back then. And Peter mentioned Jan Hus. Um, so we won't spend a lot of time on him, but he was uh, trained as a priest and wanted to fight against the corruption in the church. Things like, you know, they should just teach the plain gospel and, and they should teach it in a language people can understand. <laughs> you know, crazy things like that. And there was, there was something else about, and I can't remember the details, but about communion too. Like they were denying... both kinds. Yeah, they were denying the average person. I don't know if it was the wine. Yes. So, so the chalice becomes a big symbol of, of Jan Hus and his followers. Well, that's going to come back. So he was martyred burned at the stake, like Peter mentioned. And so this, uh, he actually, uh, great following the Hussites, which are the, which are the Protestants, and they are, um, they're fighting against the German Catholics. So again, the Germans, that's the Holy Roman Emperor, the empire, that's the German influence. Um, in this battle, in these wars, the Protestants had control of Prague for a while, and that's when they threw some officials out the town city hall window. The defenestration, the first big event of that. But the German Catholics won. Was that the window we saw? No, this comes that comes up later. It's a, it's a fine, fine national tradition. Um, the German Catholics won, and this is interesting. So German Catholics won, so Czech Hussites flee and live as kind of wandering um, exiles. And so that's where you get the word bohemian, that you kind of live kind of an unconventional wandering mm -hmm. lifestyle is from these bohemian um, Hussites <laughs> wandering through Europe. So the nobles got worried after this. Again, this is more the, the Germans. So they bring in um, weak kings that they think they can control, but they get to be controlled by others, and you have the Habsburg dynasty come in, and the Habsburgs were a German royal family um, that often held a lot of positions for the Holy Roman Empire. So the Habsburg um, basically take over. Which color are the Habsburgs? The orange. The dark orange. That shows, yeah, all the Habsburgs. So there's the Austrian <coughs> Habsburgs, <coughs> the Spain uh -huh. Habsburgs all basically related the same. So that, um, okay, so that's we're getting into the, the 1500s here. What's happening now is that actually the Ottomans are starting to threaten um, many of these areas. And so the German Czechs are a little nervous of their holdings, and so they ally themselves with the Habsburgs too. So they kind of voluntarily are getting themselves um, hooked up and you know want their power and their, their ability to fight off the Ottomans. So, uh, so the Czech king uh, allies himself. So the Habsburgs put their own prince, Ferdinand, as the Czech king during this time, and Ferdinand is Catholic, German Catholic. Uh, so tensions between the Catholics and the Protestants continue to heat up. A descendant of Ferdinand's refuses to give the Protestants religious freedom, and so this is where you have 
the Protestants taking two or three of the king's counselors and <clears throat> chucking them out the window there at the castle, which we were there at the top of the hill, which is right next to that St. Vitus Cathedral. So we got to stand at the window and, and see where, the, and, it, and it wasn't, it was more like a ceremonial tossing. It wasn't like they were going to be killed because there was kind of this sloping land. It was just kind of a shameful you know, shameful. So this is like the ground floor. Yeah, it's like the ground floor, and you know, and maybe they had a ten foot drop, and then there was a grassy hill that kind of rolled down. Yeah, so it was kind of you know just. We heard there was a huge pile of manure. Could be back the story then. I bet. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just really, yeah. So actually, it was this event at uh, now, if I can say this, Kratzeni, Kratzeni Castle in Prague. It was this event that helped spark the Thirty Years' War, which did not just involve Czech lands, but all of Europe's Catholics versus Protestants, and Thirty Years um, of that was battling. It started out as a religious thing and then became more of a political thing as it got going. But the Czechs actually, and this is 1620, the Czechs actually got decisively knocked out in 1620. Um, in the Battle of White Mountain, um, they got they were completely outgunned, outmanned, um, didn't have a hope. The the Czech Protestants against the German Catholics, you know, the Habsburg <clears throat> dynasty, and and the the Czech forces lost thousands and thousands and thousands of lives against maybe a few hundred of the, the German Catholic forces. So they were reduced. Now this proud Bohemian kingdom is really no longer. It's reduced to basically just a fiefdom of the Habsburgs at this point. So at the uh, what happens at the end of the Battle of White Mountain and then this Treaty of Westphalia, I guess is that you know at the end of the Thirty Years' War, really what's what is spelled out for the Czechs is cultural genocide. Um, they they make it illegal. To publish anything in the Czech language, they make it illegal to teach in the Czech language. You have to speak in German. You have to publish in German. Um, zealous Jesuit priests actually went into towns and burned Czech libraries of literature, destroyed all this stuff. Um, they suppressed their culture. Roman Catholicism became the state religion. Um, <clears throat> Upper class was the Viennese German, the lower class was Czech. So if you were speaking Czech, that was even seen as seen as lower class. Capital became Vienna um, of, of the empire. Prague was more seen as a backwater nowhere place. And um, the architecture was being built by foreigners. Foreigners were making the decisions. So like Czech culture was, was disappearing. One thing maybe since we will be spending more time in Moravia than Bohemia, they were governed separately and really kept apart from each other by the Habsburgs. Mm. They govern Moravia and Bohemia separately. Hmm. And another way of destroying any Czech synergy. Oh, yeah, it was ever be. And so there's still this division of, of sorts between them, culturally even, that they're different. You may see some threads of that. Um, so things were pretty grim. Holy Roman Emperor Joseph II, though, I don't know if he was getting twinge of conscience. Um, <laughs> he, against the Pope's recommendation, he, he issued this tolerance patent, which was trying to extend religious freedom to non-Catholics. Um, so now, non-Catholics could own property, could actually hold public office, could actually practice trades, could actually obtain academic degrees. So this wasn't possible before that. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. So during this time um, of being really, really suppressed, and, and especially Protestants being really suppressed, they didn't forget Jan Hus. And that symbol of the chalice became kind of a national symbol of their identity. And I was really interested to notice, so this was a, this was that church we visited with the mm -hmm. Keep Smiling Choir. Look what's carved in mm -hmm. into the pews there. 
All right, the late 1700s. So we talked about that tolerance patent. So the late 1700s is kind of the Czech Renaissance, which is a little bit later than the rest of Europe, which is, the Renaissance is kind of 1300s to 1600s. So the Czech is kind of getting a Renaissance. They're, they've got the first Czech newspaper appears during this time. Uh, first Czech National Museum uh, appears. Scholars start using the Czech language at this time and they start recreating a Czech identity. Also what starts to happen at this time, late 1700s, is the Industrial Revolution has been kind of plowing through Europe. And so uh, people in, in Czech lands start moving towards cities and factories get um, built and Czech industries actually become the heart of the Habsburg Empire as far as producing producing things. So that, that's going on and that becomes crucial because these Czech lands start becoming, you know, um, desired by, by certain people in the future, like Hitler and, and such. Uh, 1806, Napoleon defeats the Habsburg forces. It's the end of the Holy Roman Empire to an extent, but Czech is still a part of a German-Austrian empire. It hasn't really gotten free. So Austria-Hungary at that point? Um, it's coming coming up. Um, oh, during this time also of this renaissance and <clears throat> industry, it's also growing um, like Czech intellectualism. There's this book called The History of the Czech Nation. And the, the, he writes a lot about, you know, the pride of the nation. And, and he sees it as the Slavic people versus the Germans. And, and that they will, their only salvation is through education, but we can, we can do this, we can come to peace um, without any violence. And this actually inspires um, leaders that are coming up in the, in the Czech, Czech area. Uh, so 1867, that's when uh, the Habsburgs, the Austrian Habsburgs join with Hungary and it becomes the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So Czechs and Slovaks are together under this Austro-Hungarian Empire and they suffer together <laughs> under heavy taxes and economic misery. Okay, so right in here we're before, so there's the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they're still over. Dictators don't really get to say in what, what they're doing culturally. They're, um, their lives are blooming a little bit, but um, politically they're still under the thumb. <clears throat> the Austro-Hungarian Empire sides with the Germans in World War I versus England and France. Um, the Czechs and Slovaks, of course, are drafted to fight, and a lot of them desert. Um, some of the <clears throat> men that become leaders here coming up, uh, Mazurik, Mazurik, <clears throat> Mazurik, and Benish, they flee to France. And in Paris, they kind of gain allied support to create a new nation. Once this World War I is over, they are starting to drum up support for independence. So that then when you get the end of World War I, you have the birth of Czechoslovakia. So there was, there was before World War I, and there's after. Now you'll notice that, that Czechoslovakia is not the only country that was created at the end of World War I. There was also uh, Poland, there was also Hungary, there was also Yugoslavia, and actually uh, Czechoslovakia was doing really well. Like they had all the, the industry, the factories, they were able to produce, and they had um, Tomáš Masaryk, who was the first president of Czechoslovakia. And October 28th, 1918, that's their Independence Day. That's what they, they celebrate for, for years and years. So this ends really 400 years of being under this German, you know, Austrian influence, the Holy Roman Empire, the, you know, all of this. 400 years, finally, in the World War I, they're free. Uh, by the 1930s, okay, here's, here's Tomasz. By the 1930s, so he's doing a lot of things, you know, he's trying to, he, he writes a new constitution, 
Um, he tries to, in, you know, instigate um, capitalist and um, democracy, and he tries to grow the industry. But what there's also this growing problems, unemployment and ethnic tensions. So there's 51% of Czechs, and they control all the government. And then you have the Slovaks, who are actually kind of ending up being the poorer class, and they're getting more and more upset. And then you also have three and a half million Germans who are in the Sudetenland area, and they're clamoring for their own rights. So there's a lot of growing tensions in the 30s. Um, Masaryk resigns, and uh, Benish succeeds him. So Sudetenland. So there, there it is. And you know, Hitler, he um, <coughs> marched into Austria. And then he told Czechoslovakia, he said, you need to give this area of Germans their free self-governing rights. You need to set them free or else I'm going to come in and declare war on you. And that's when you get the Great Britain and France coming together with Hitler and Mussolini, the Munich Pact. And, and they're saying, okay, okay, all right, all right, we'll, we'll give you that. You promise not to do anything else? Okay, all right. And so they, they, you know, pat themselves on the back that they've appeased this man and they've helped make peace in Europe. Um, so Czechs are kind of powerless to do anything else and they give Hitler Sudetenland. Uh, then, of course, Hitler's not satisfied and he wants Czech lands, he wants the weapons, he wants the factories. And in 1939, the Nazis invade Prague. No allies come to their rescue. They condemn it, but they don't come to their rescue. And uh, Czechoslovakia becomes a German protectorate. And this picture, I thought, is really mm -hmm. telling of the complete, you know, glee and enthusiasm, the kind of shock and resignation and utter despair as, as the still Nazis still saying, I have Hitler. Yeah, and standing there on the street. So what happened to the, the Czech people, workers and students became forced labor, either in factories in the Czechoslovakia or in Germany even. 100,000 Jews and gypsies, concentration camps. But um, there were resistance. There were guerrilla groups that, that joined together and fought, fought the Nazis in little ways. And you know that uh, like big cities like Prague escaped major bombing and destruction because they became this German protectorate so early in the, in the whole process. So a lot of the old buildings are still, still there. So Edvard Benisch, uh, he actually, when Hitler came in, he fled and set up a government in exile in London and uh, was trying to keep things going from, from afar. The Soviets offered to help Czechoslovakia to fight the Nazis, um, and so Benish gave them his full support. And the Communist Party actually helped those little guerrilla groups fight against the Nazis. This made the Czechs more sympathetic to communist government during this, during this hard time. So 1945, end of World War II, the Nazis and, I mean, uh, Soviet troops and US liberate, liberate Prague and very excited to see them. So then Benish comes back to Czechoslovakia. Well, he wants to start up again. It starts really good, starts as a democracy, but he's noticing he has the Soviets like right there. They're like helping. <laughs> they won't go. They, they are there to stay. And so there's Stalin and, and Benish and, and some Czech <clears throat> politicians like quit out of protest. Well, the communists just fill their positions with loyal communist members. Um, many of the Czech people are really excited that the Soviets are there. They helped them during the war and they really like their plan. The Soviets are deporting three million Germans, get them out of here, and we're going to take your land, thank you very much, and redistribute it to the Czech, Czech people. So a lot of the Czechs really like that plan. So you know, a lot were very happy to have, have the Soviets there. <coughs> 
What happens, however, is 20 long years, what they call the dark winter of, um, of communist suppression. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, there's these small little stories that are rather fascinating, and rather interesting, but um, just in general, so they recruited lots of members to the Communist Party, and actually Czechoslovakia had more communist members than any other non-Soviet country in the world. They rewrote the Constitution. Um, Benish, uh, the president, resigned, and he died just three months later. They say kind of a broken man. They collectivized the farms. They took over industry, no private property anymore. All the factories were set to supply the Soviet Union. Personal freedom ends, it becomes basically a police state. Um, I mentioned, you know, uh, Tomasz Masaryk. Um, his son was a foreign minister at this time, and he didn't like the communists, and he was starting to speak out against them. And he mysteriously died falling out his own apartment window. And, um, they said, oh, it was a suicide. And then years, 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 years later, the communists uh, retracted that story and said, no, it was an accident. He was, he was doing a yoga pose in his windowsill because he couldn't sleep. That was the official story. Wow. Okay, then in these years, <laughs> in these years, Stalin used Czechoslovakia as like as an example to other satellite countries of people that maybe weren't obeying as well. And so there was a lot of like show trials, like accusing politicians and business leaders of false charges, conspiracy. So they were either put to death right away or arrested or imprisoned or sent to labor camps. 180 politicians were executed at this time. 130,000 ordinary Czech citizens were either arrested, imprisoned, or sent to labor camps, or just executed during Susie, this time. what year is this? This is 1948 to 1953, okay. is the years. I, I was born in 53. This is recent history, and that's why we thought this was so important that we give her this time. These are parents and grandparents of people we will meet. This is their history. This is their personal family history. Uh, Daniela's grandfather was imprisoned, I believe. Remember? Anyway, well, it was kind it's, of like... it's all everyone knew someone um, who suffered greatly. Mm -hmm. um, this is this is what they're coming out of. So the 1960s, there was serious recession in the economy. There was demonstrations, you know, people were getting a little tired of this. Um, so in January of 1968, they decide, the communists decide to put uh, uh, Dubček, I guess, Dubček in power. And he was a communist and he had a Czech background, but they figured this guy, everybody likes this guy. Who's going to get upset at this guy really is why they put him into power. And he let in, they say, the light and fresh air. He created socialism with a face, but he really, he, he, traded, he stopped the censorship. He allowed people to print the truth. He opened up private enterprise. He increased trade with the West. So he was actually doing real things to make people's lives better. Well, won't you know, if you loosen the restrictions, somebody writes a manifesto against the communists and gets all people upset. And so the communists want to check to you know, denounce him and condemn it, and he won't. So that ends Prague Spring. So he was put in power in January. There's Prague Spring, a brief time of, you know, of, of lessening of the restrictions. And then in August, bam, the Soviets come in, they yank him out of power, they arrest him, war planes are landing at the Prague airport, 200,000 troops are descending, tanks are rolling into Prague. Um, the Soviets hope to be seen as liberators. No, mm -hmm. nobody's buying that. Um, 200 Czechs and Slovaks were killed just during this, this invasion. In despair and frustration, a 21-year-old student set himself on fire in the square in Prague, you seen as a martyr to the Soviet. There's a memorial to that that we can see. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so now they're completely under the Soviet control. Um, the 1970s economic stagnation, super high inflation. There's um, occasional demonstrations and protests. So one of the leaders, we're, we're coming here, we're the home stretch people, here we go. One of the leaders of this time is Vaclav Havel and his organization, his human rights movement is called Charter 77. And that's him right there. And he was a playwright, a Czech playwright. And he, um, during that Prague Spring, when there was a loosening of you know, restrictions, his plays were actually performed and he got to be famous and, and he was you know, really poking fun at the Soviets. Well, that got shut down pretty quickly. His plays were forbidden. Nobody could you know, publish them, nobody could perform them at all. All right, they, they uh, formed a real threat to the Soviets. One of the leaders of Charter 77 was mysteri mysteriously died in prison while he'd been arrested by the Soviets. Um, Havel himself was, uh, was arrested and tried and um, sentenced to hard labor for four or five years. He almost died from pneumonia, so they actually <coughs> released him. So this was going on. And then kind of part of what changed things is 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev came to power and um, brought a lot of reform and change to the Soviet Union. Yeah, so 1980s, you see throughout Europe, a throwing off of the communists <clears throat> by Poland, which was a 10 year battle really actively. Um, this was from that uh, shores of what was that? Shores of uh, Bohemia? Coasts of, Bo Coast of Bohemia. This, this uh, newspaper reporter went in and he was spending time in, in Central Europe during this time and he said it was really interesting. Poland, throwing off the communists, took 10 years. Hungary, it took 10 months. East Germany, 10 weeks. And then it hits Czechoslovakia and really it just took 10 days. Uh, and what you have is the Velvet Revolution, and that's one of the kind of the most famous pictures depicting that November 1989. This was called the most delightful of all Central European revolutions. <laughs> that's the same square. That and that is the same square that yes, in, in Prague, the Wenceslas Square. Where the tanks had been. Where the tanks had yes. What was that? Václav Namies. Very good, yes. So it started out mostly students and intellectuals, and the police came in and would would brutally attack them at these these protests. But they gained sympathy of a lot of the workers. Um, crowd swelled to two hundred thousand. <laughs> um, opposition groups joined forces, and they called themselves the Civic Forum. Havel was their leader, and he he said. He was a spokesman on behalf of that part of Czechoslovak public, which is increasingly critical of existing Czechoslovak leadership. <laughs> that was his fighting words, I guess. <laughs> uh, so there's again some more. Um, is that part focus. of the reflection of the culture where they don't want to uh, confront people? I don't know. I don't know. Six. The theaters were the basis of. Oh yeah, there were a lot of like so he was a playwright and there was a lot of artists meeting together in the theater that was their headquarters. The theater was their headquarters. Something louder. Yeah, I can't remember. On the sixth day, <coughs> Dubček, right, who had been in Soviet prison after not following the communists, he gave a speech and called for a new government and freely elected people. Three days later, the communist leadership resigned, but then they put in new communist leaders. <laughs> The next day, there's another picture. The next day, protesters in Prague grew to 800,000. Protestants and Catholics, Czechs and Slovaks joined. They organized a two hour strike across the country. The whole country shut down. They walked out and stood in the streets and people just cried for joy that they could have this effect and the communists really pulled out. And that was it. So it was seen as a miracle that after all these years of repression and terror and death, the Czechs were able to end the communist rule bloodlessly without a single loss of life here in this Velvet Revolution. Um, and they, okay, we'll go back. So 
Briefly, Václav Havel was asked to be the interim leader, and his quote, what he said was, Dear friends, I promise you I will not betray your confidence. So I think that's just really important because there's so many times that their confidence has been, been betrayed. Um, so 1990, they have free elections, but then there's still this tension between Slovaks and the Czechs and the prime minister of this part and the prime minister of this part were arguing and discussing how to split apart the country right away. And actually Havel resigned. He didn't want to see his country broken apart. But in 1993, January is the Velvet Divorce and they, they split apart. And uh, Havel, Václav Havel is actually elected as the first president of the Czech Republic. Um, and he filled his council with artists and writers. <laughs> and they said he rides a scooter in the halls of the castle. And there he is meeting with Clinton. And they joined NATO in 1999, Czech Republic did, and they joined the European Union in 2004. And I thought this, this next thing is kind of interesting. There's this communist museum in Prague. And I thought if we ever have a chance, we've got to go see this place. But this just cracked me up. So you got to read these little things. I love that. And then you couldn't get laundry detergent, but you could get your brain washed. Communist museum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's it. Thank you. Charles Bridge. Yeah. Charles Bridge.